The greatest power you possess is your ability to choose. Join Lowe's Moore as he reveals how you can begin to maximize that power by exploring yourself on the deepest levels and committing to making lasting and positive changes. Get ready to achieve breakthroughs that will lead to accelerated growth and transformation because you are now tuned in to The Blueprint. Good evening, this is Lowe's Moore, and I want to welcome you back to The Blueprint Podcast. As many of you know, we are we are here every Sunday with the exception of maybe some specials that we have, and then we'll show a Saturday morning special. But every Sunday from 7 to 8.30 live on Facebook, Lowe's More The Blueprint on Facebook and Lowe's More The Blueprint on YouTube. And if you guys don't mind, when you go to YouTube, if you would just subscribe right subscribe to the blueprint podcast man be greatly appreciated man hope you love hope you like and or love the show um i know i i, I really enjoy bringing it every week um I, I enjoy uh the opportunity to have um you know have people come on because i you know i was just sharing with somebody that everybody has a story and i i love uh talking to individuals and bringing out uh you know their stories and bringing out the best in, in in them as well um to make them feel comfortable right while they you know a lot of people come on i don't know you guys don't know some some people are seasoned they do this they do this for a living they they do podcasts they do television they do all kind of things they used to be in in front of the mic or on on youtube or facebook but there are a lot of people that i bring on it's not something that they do every single day right and one of the one of the things i've learned about uh in regards to me and the power of communications one one of the things that i've, I've learned right that there is a gift in the person hosting the show I mean, if you're watching the late night show or back in the day, you 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 watch Arsenio Hall, David Letterman or, you know, all those all those great shows or Steve Harvey. You know, I realized that in doing this, there there's a there's a certain gift that you have to have, which is to make your guests feel comfortable uh, to the point where they relax and they feel comfortable sharing. Um, I realized that I have a little of that gift. The ability to to calm the situation down, to ask certain questions, and to get to to get them to share uh, things that we may we may think that you need to know, and the things that will benefit you, um, and 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 some things that you can learn from each of the guests, or or including myself. So, uh, I, I really enjoyed this. I, I really love doing it. You know, I love communication and. Um, you know, I love seeing people grow uh, from one point in their life to the next point in their life. Um, and it's been my pleasure over these last few years. Now we're in our third season over these last few years to be here during the course of this pandemic uh, to help people relax, feel comfortable and help them to manage to get through uh, such a tough time in all of our lives. You know, so uh, real, real quickly, let me. Let me just share uh, something that I had heard earlier today. Uh, one, one of my favorite speakers is Dr. Miles Monroe, and he was doing a session. I was listening to him. May he rest in peace. Uh, his, his things are still relevant today. The, the messages that he shared on leadership and on kingdom are still relevant today. They're still important today. They transcend his life. The things that he he taught over the years has transcend his life. Uh, you can use you can use those things today and tomorrow and for years to come. And he, he was talking about um, the importance of wealth. Right. And the difference between being poor or in poverty or being rich. Right. Or being rich or being wealthy. Right. Uh, you know, uh, you know, being poor. Yeah, you know, most most folks who are poor, they want things, right? Um, and they 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 need things, things that they don't have, 
uh, because they lack the resources or lack opportunities for for jobs or, or whatever it may be that calls for them to be in this place of poverty, right? And to be rich, uh, most of us that want to be rich, we want to dominate. We want things, right? Um, and 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 uh, you know, we we're concerned more about money right than anything else and then but being wealthy you're never really concerned about money at all right you're concerned about what he said was the most important thing if you can if you have ideas if you can think and you have ideas if you can be creative you can always get resources and also he said that resources is not just in 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 things or money but resources is in family right it, it, it's it's more than just this money but it's in family and and uh and it's in residual income right i, I liked a lot of things i i like the i liked a lot of things he said uh throughout it was something that inspired me today right i don't know if you guys have an idea right i don't know if you're struggling or uh you you know maybe like me at one time we may find ourselves to be in transition and we don't know what we're going to do next but if you can come up with an idea right i mean i mean i would love to hear some of those ideas that you have um as you move forward in life right and as you started thinking about uh your future do you have any ideas is there something that you're thinking about that you want to do um, and you don't know how to move forward on it. And, um, but if you have an idea, you can always be successful, right? And so again, I wanna thank you and welcome you back to the Blueprint Podcast. And let's let's get rolling right here. I just want to share that with you, but let's get rolling here. I have my uh, book of the week. All right. Uh, John Lucas, winning a day at a time. Uh, many of you won't know John Lucas. You see him there. He was a coach in the NBA. But John Lucas was one of the greatest African-American tennis players, played tennis for the University of Maryland, and also basketball at the same time, right? He, he, he was an All-American in tennis in college and he was an all-american in basketball got drafted into the nba had a an extensive career in the nba but it didn't come without problems right uh john john found himself in in some and some of the things that we're going to talk about tonight he found himself in in some very addictive behaviors and he he talks about in his book how he had to live one day at a time, had to, how he had to fight every single, every single day, man, that just to be, you know, just, just to be focused on, on being able to do his job as a basketball player and as a coach. And every day he was battling with, uh, you know, uh, not, tr not going back into the addictive behaviors. And, and John, you know, has helped thousands of people. He started his own rehab center, his own addiction clinic. Um, and, you know, I think he has one in Houston. I think he has, has one in a number of places. He's still coaching. But uh, he he's seen that he had problems. And, he, and being an NBA player, he was able to start a business uh, that would help people. And he's helped thousands of people. And I salute John Lucas tonight and uh and and i thank god for him right that he didn't let that addiction o overtake him but he was working to overcome it and so if you didn't get a chance it's an old book right you're gonna have to look that up uh it's an old book but it's a very valuable book to have in your library and then next we're gonna have our our word of the week right and you, you know i've been on a series here with these words of the week um Earlier, I had the word love, joy, and last week I had peace. And of course, these are, are the fruits, the fruit of the spirit, right? You notice it says fruit of the spirit, which means that the one fruit is love and the manifestation of love, 
right? The attributes of love you see manifested in these other words. And I, and I keep saying that word manifest because that's one of the things that we have to learn how to do in our lifestyle. We have to manifest these attributes. So if you can, uh, if you can show that again, uh, this week's word is patience, right? We have to learn how to be patient right that's the word of the week patient man i know we don't we want everything right now we want everything instantly we want to put everything in the microwave and get it hot right now right but some things just take time you have to learn how to be patient right and that's the word of the week and then here's the affirmation right the affirmation of the for this week um and it says be who you are and say what you feel because those who my, who mind don't matter and those who matter don't mind that's from dr seuss right uh you know our, our childhood you know we grew up on dr seuss and let me say that again let me read it again be who you are and say what you feel because those who mind don't matter and those who matter don't mind that's our that's our here hill hopper pierce hopper affirmation quote for this week and and let me jump right into our uh music right our music and movie of the week and we have the temptations i mean if you tonight if you if, if you have a favorite song of the temptations i want you to pop your favorite songs or maybe your favorite one or two songs that the that temptations sung um and man i want you to pop that up there for me write it down in there so i can see it and then i'll just shout it out and and then the, and and the movie of this week is uh denzel washington oh my wife got my girl my girl yeah i like my girl and i, I Man, I, heard, I seen the Temptations at the Apollo Theater. Ooh, they were amazing at the Apollo Theater, man. I was I was a young man in high school when I saw the Temptation. They were just awesome. And then Denzel Washington's Flight, as you know, um, you know Denzel plays a, a person who had an addiction. A uh, very powerful, powerful movie. Uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, take the time to watch it um and and uh enjoy it right and uh use it as a tool and then i got a few hey this is my wife called this broke vember right there's means so many birthdays in november it don't make no sense right so <laughs> check out these birthdays man oh man we look look at all them birthdays you got uh man whoo who do i start Well, Kalila had her birthday party the other day. Uh, happy heavenly birthday to Von Shalik. Uh, there's Lil Nelson over there, Riley, Debbie, and I, that's my cousin Penelope on the 20th. And, man, Shaheen on the 14th, Kalila on the 16th, Von Shalik on the 17th, Nelson on the 18th, Riley on the 19th, Debbie on the 19th and penelope on the 20th Woo! happy birthday everybody man uh god bless you guys man it's my pleasure to shout you out this evening and uh and of course my baby girl it's sherelle's birthday it's your birthday it's your birthday that's my baby girl sherelle oh man i got a little quick story you see that picture over there and sherelle right there in the corner with the little nice white suit and the and the bow in her head, right? Uh, Sherelle had a tendency to always have a mean face. So all the way to the uh, school, the preschool, I was I knew it was picture day, right? I said, uh, Sherelle, so you're gonna smile for Daddy in the picture, right? Because she would never smile. So I said, you gonna smile for Daddy in the picture, and you know when you take your pictures a day, and she nod her head, yeah, 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 just nod her head. And I said, yeah, yeah. She, I said, you gonna, you gonna, you gonna smile for daddy, right? In the picture, and she's not a hair, yeah. Uh, and, and and so, uh, she took the picture. She got in the car. I said, did you smile? She just nodded her head like like she was saying yes. 
uh, and then a few weeks later, we got the picture back. There's the picture right there. There is no smile on her face. When I saw that picture, I just. <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> we're going to get rolling right now. Uh, I think we're going to show you uh, two two videos. I'm going to introduce my my guest for this evening. And, uh, it, you know, we're going to. This is going to be, uh, you know, a, a subject that we need to have a conversation about and we need to have a conversation about this organization. And and so let, let me show you these highlights and then we'll jump into it. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the 18th Annual National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence Annual Luncheon. Uh, I know you're having a great time there at Molino's Lake Isle Country Club, and, and just want to say that uh, I want to also be one of those people who, who actually offers my congratulations and our thanks to the, the, the 21 counselors and leaders in your area and all across the country who are making a difference, who are helping folks. I don't know how to express my gratitude today. My gratitude that we are here together, even if we look like a bunch of bandits with masks on, we're here and we are showing up for life. Uh, so I played um, eight years of professional basketball and and i and i loved it and uh one of the things as i was writing my book i realized that uh i hadn't gotten over early childhood trauma right <laughs> being you know in your 50s and still have this residual effect that's in the back of your head when i met joan and she took me around to see a couple of the youth programs and I, I started to realize how powerful, uh, if I had had this program when I was a little kid, would you know, come with these amazing stories and these amazing teachers, and, and, and they're talking to you, and they're bringing something, you know, they're, they're bringing something out of you. And, and your support of those programs is gonna be crucial. As Dennis just said, we're in a pandemic, right? And, that's trauma all by itself. ADD. And if you mention that to people, they wonder, what does that spell? Well, it spells to me, and likely to you, hope. 22 years, December the 24th of this year. I came to Joan in his shelter. My spirit was broken. I was sitting in the DSS office, and this lady came to me that I know and directed me to Joan. And this is something I wanted to do because people like me, that all of y'all in this room think y'all have not helped. Y'all have. Even if they don't get back to you and tell you, thank you, y'all have. Y'all have touched our lives. More so, I have five children. And six grandchildren. And they've never been more proud of me because of you, Joan, that this program that you have is the best program in the world. The battle that we're getting ready to go into is going to be two years after COVID slows down. One of the things that I learned is how we work together. We're forced in situations, but we overcome it. But the biggest challenge for us, and part of the aftermath, we'll see the PTSD, the trauma. How do we provide this network? For this network, we have to make a personal promise to ourselves. How do we take care of us and how do we instill this energy to other people? We have to reintroduce people to how to live. 
The dangerous things about addiction and isolation, clients live up in their head. And living up in their head, the, the fear is unimaginable. The greatest thing we can do is smile. Just say it's gonna get better. And it's that camaraderie that pulls us through, especially when we're feeling like there's no hope. We're ordinary people doing exceptional things to impact people's lives. What to be better. We're gonna be okay. Awesome. I want to welcome to the blueprint, Dennis Andrews. What's up, Dennis? Hey, Lowe's. How are you? I am good, man. No complaints, man. None, none, none at all, man. Um, welcome to the blueprint, man. And no, it's uh, an honor. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I know Joan was supposed to be on with us tonight, um, but hey, we're gonna do our thing anyway. Uh, Joan, Joan's amazing. Uh, I want you to talk a little bit about uh, Joan before we get before we get going here. Well, you, you know, Lowe's, we were we referred to Joan as the Energizer Bunny. She <laughs> never stops. Eighty two years old, doesn't sleep. She'll call you at ten o'clock at night saying that she has some brainstorming, and when she brainstorms, she puts it in action. She doesn't put it on the back burner. She makes it happen. That's one of the amazing things about working with her is that she doesn't take anything for granted. She wants it to happen. She wants it to happen yesterday. And she's had this energy for the last 20 years, at least when I've been involved with her. Yeah, I I, I agree with you 100% because when uh, Joan and I met, right, uh, she said, oh, I have these programs for you. She had this amazing energy. I got these programs for you. I need, I want you to see, you don't want to see if you could get them in the boys and girls club, you know, uh, can you, you have time. And I was like, yeah, you know, I got time. And, and, uh, I think one day we met at an elementary school, right? Matter of fact, we went to two elementary schools that, uh, NCADD was, uh, participating in. And I went in and had the opportunity to see. Uh, Joan was excited, right? She was bubbly. And the individuals that were sharing in those, particularly in those kindergarten classes, right? And those first and second grade classes, which we don't think, when we think about trauma, we don't think about kindergarten, you know, and we don't think about first and second grade right and uh and i had heard so many different stories about kids coming into um into their morning classes right uh a little distraught you know a little angry uh not themselves right and and then somewhere down the line you find out that some things that happen in their home right and these kids come to school and we don't know why right and that's what i learned about ncadd coming in and helping young people manage early childhood trauma i mean it was just it was just amazing to see how they how they managed those kids all the things that they taught the teachers how to be aware of what a kid may be going through particularly if it's not consistent Right, what a kid may be going through when they come in and start acting out of character, man. So I was so I was so pumped that I said, Joan, we gotta have we gotta have the youth programs at the boys and girls club. And then we had it for the elementary school, we had programs for the middle school, mm -hmm. and we also had programs for the high school. So and Joan had all the passion and energy that any any young person had. So yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, when we came to the boys club, the, the, the children were amazing. How resilient they were, how they were seeking information. Uh, the life skills program gives them a voice and allows them to process so they don't have to internalize everything and perceive life as just one way, especially if there's trauma, because that becomes progressive. And when we were at the boys club, I, I can actually, I remember one uh, young lady, 
uh, probably no more than 10 or 11, around this time of the year, she said to me, can you help me keep my father sober for Thanksgiving? And she was saying her biological father died from drugs. Her stepfather, she loved very much, but he drank a lot. And uh, I said to her, why don't you invite your, your dad to watch a movie with you, but ask him to promise not to drink, to have dinner with everybody and sit and watch a movie with you and your siblings without alcohol. And I remember coming back the next week and she was smiling. She was saying, you know what? He didn't drink on Thanksgiving and he watched the movie with me and my brother. It's pretty powerful. You know, you, you make suggestions and many of the kids were taking advantage of it. Uh, the energy, the resilience is so, so powerful. That was one of the amazing things about the boys club, the amount of energy those kids had and the care that was there. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll say this, uh, we're going to, we're going to have more conversations about this. Uh, we want to get to know a little bit about, um, about you, Dennis, before we move forward. And, but I want, I want to say this, I, and I remember, um, that you guys were dealing with a, uh, a young person at, the, at the, at the boys, boys and girls club. And they were talking about, um, they confined in, in, in the teacher that they, they were thinking about always thinking about jumping off a building. Right. And, uh, they were very young. So, uh, and then of course, when those types of things happen, you have to alert us right um we have to bring in family right and we have to have a conversation with why this why why your child is uh saying these things what's 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 causing this and and so we wouldn't we 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 probably were able to prevent a situation but it it could have been a bad situation if NCADD, you guys were not there to be able, you said earlier, to get kids to share, you know, to share their feelings, to be comfortable, to get to the place of trust where they could share their feelings with you and we're able to get help for them as well. So very powerful. Yeah. So, yeah, man, kudos to you. Uh, uh, to to Joan and to NCADD. I have to say before we get going, I, I'm a board member. You know, I was so impressed. Um, I, you know, it's been tough for the, uh, you know, for since now that I you know retired, grandkids stuff like that uh, to be active. But uh, you know, I told Joan I wanted to be more active. But uh, I am a participating board member. We had a wonderful uh, gala, uh, I guess about a month ago right yeah. it was it was an awesome time so uh you know thanks uh, i'm 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 it's my pleasure it's a privilege uh to to be a part of the organization and my wife will help me out as well because she used to attend a number of things with ncadd as well so um but let's get to know dennis a little bit so uh dennis uh talk talk a little bit about you, yourself man where you grew up and uh family and you know, uh, you know, because three, you know, three things that we kind of fo try to focus on in the beginning is the importance of family, importance of faith, and the importance of education. So, you know, take us through your your journey. All right. Well, thank you for inviting me on this journey. Grew up <laughs> in Mount Vernon. Grew up in Mount Vernon across the street from Longfellow School. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, Mount, Mount Vernon back then was an amazing place. Uh, you had a community that looked out for each other. Uh, I went to Longfellow School for a little while, uh, struggled a little bit in, in elementary school. My parents put me in uh, Catholic school. Uh, I went to Catholic school, uh, then went to uh, Catholic high school in New Rochelle. And you know, what was so great, great about my and I can tell you, um, I would see Ray Williams, Gus Williams, these guys would be at the park. I'd watch them play. They were, you know, it was just, everybody knew each other. Uh, it was a great place to grow up. Uh, one of the st stories I always share, um, we all used to go to Fourth Avenue to shop. Everybody bought their clothes on Fourth Avenue. <laughs> I had right. to be, I had to be about uh, 12 or 13. I have a twin brother. We go up to the Avenue and uh, 
my mother was had a good relationship with Denzel Washington's mother, Mrs. Washington. And I remember one Saturday I didn't speak to her because I was trying to be cool, trying to say hello to a young lady. <laughs> and before I got home, Miss Washington had already called my mother <laughs> and said, the chubby twin didn't speak. So my mother got me on the phone. I had to call Miss Washington to apologize. I had a little bit of an attitude. My mother told me it wasn't good enough. She told Miss Washington, he's walking up to the house and he's got to apologize in person. I walked up to her house. I thought she was going to be easy on me. And she said, what are you going to do next time you see me? I'm going to, I'm going to say, hello, Ms. Washington. And she held me to it. That's how, that's how Mount Vernon was. Everybody knew each other. It was a city where we took care of the kids. You couldn't, they didn't want us to fail. I remember watching you play. You went to school with my sister, Cecilia Andrews. Mm. You guys were in school together. That's my oldest sister. I have a twin brother. I have uh, two sisters. My oldest sister passed away a few years ago, Denise. And actually, Denise uh, went to school with Denzel. They, they were friends. Okay. So everybody knew each other. A uh, great community to grow up with and uh, watch you playing basketball. would sneak up to the boys club to watch the games. Uh, Fourth Street, we played. We had fun. Uh, it was just a great atmosphere. Everybody knew each other. Uh, when I got to high school, I played high school basketball uh, in a private school. Played in the tournaments, was scared to death to play against Mount Vernon. <laughs> you know, I was, was lucky that we were a small school, so I didn't get, I didn't have to play Mount Vernon. But growing up in Mount Vernon was amazing. Went to Marist College, got a bachelor's degree in police science, got my MSW from Fordham University. Uh, been working in the field for 38 years uh, as a substance abuse counselor. I'm a licensed social worker and a master, KSAC. And I was remembering what you were saying. I worked for Westchester Community Opportunity Program uh, for about 26 years. And then it came a point where they got rid of the substance abuse programs. And I found myself for the first time in my career unemployed and got involved with trying to open up a small team practice in Nourish that I'm still involved with and started teaching. I teach at uh, Mercy College. I'm the director of their KSAC program for undergrad and graduate, and I teach for NCADD. I'm the dean of their academic program for their KSAC to become certified counselors, our accelerated program, our Saturday program, and our evening program. My journey has been has been pretty good. I mean, I I will say education is so important because it gives you choices. I mean, that was the one thing that uh, I say is so important. And you know what? Uh, I would tell any young person that journey in education is not always that easy. I had a lot of struggles uh, early in with school, hmm. but once I found what I wanted and, and I had great people helping me, uh, education became this avenue that gave me a different perspective on looking at life. Plus being blessed to grow up in Mount Vernon. And I remember you, you were the kind of guy that everybody spoke to each other. Everybody spoke to each other. Everybody got along. Uh, there were fights, but it was never anything where people got shot. And I can tell you the what really resonates for me. I remember when uh, Timmy, which was Ray and Gus's nephew, got mm. killed. It, it was so overwhelming how everybody came together that was so in, impacted. That's how tight knit Mount Vernon was, and I benefit from it because I always believed that the journey coming through Mount Vernon was the foundation for success. That role wasn't easy, you know, but once I connected and this career found me, that was the thing I think that was so important. Um, I never expected to be a social worker or to be a help provider, but this career found me. And once it found me, you know, I took it to a level to the best of my ability. I think one of my assets, the blessing of growing up in, in Mount Vernon, people always say this guy's not telling the truth. I'm in my early 60s. I've never, ever been high. I've never, ever been intoxicated. I grew mm. up in Mount Vernon. I had so many people around me guiding me that it was just something I never did. Sports was my avenue. Playing a lot of sports. Uh, one of my hangouts, you laugh at this. I used to hang out <laughs> at the library. I go to the library, read a lot of books on sports, science. That was my safe haven. Uh, so, you know, my experience growing up was great and it was just a blessing 
to be able to become a social worker and give back and work with Joan because she's opened up another avenue of learning for me and experience of working with diverse groups, uh, people with economic means, people without economic means. It's a good experience. So, you know, uh, meeting you, being on the board, the things that <clears throat> we've done. I've always followed your career. Then to have you on the board, uh, our conversations, they've been amazing. This has been a great journey for me. Bless yeah. me part of that yeah awesome man and you know um when when you you said something interesting because you know, every week we always talk about this you got to point out some what i consider nuggets like I, I always tell every week you know my grandfather said come here boy i got a nugget for you you know like that and i'm thinking like i'm looking at his hand like he had something in it you know there's a, a nugget in his hand and he used to always talk to me right and he used to always say important things that I probably didn't understand at the time, right? And we say on the show, you you, you know, you always hear nuggets, right? But you have to identify, you, you said, you know, I had some great people helping me, right? And then you also said, um, and then in, in the education, I found something, right? And and I think that's one of a real key is is, is going through the education process Many of us don't have any interest, you know, when we're growing up. OK, we're taking all the what we consider the major subjects, English, math, history, so forth and so on. But it's hard to find our niche. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, because I didn't I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I went to college. I'm, You know, I just knew I wanted to go to college and I knew I, I, I had an opportunity to play basketball. Right. So that was the thing that was driving me in the classroom. But when I got to college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. <laughs> I mean, I like, you know, I took general studies to start out, you know, because I didn't know what sub, what what career I was going to go into. And I just have I was taking a bunch of different classes and I happened to take this uh, communication class. Right. Where you're talking about small groups, large group, mass mass communications. Right. And then you had to write something and then you had to make a speech now i'm you know i'm not one i'm I, I grew up shy so i'm not one for making speeches i mean the boys club helped me to make little speeches but now i'm in a classroom full of people and then they're teaching me the art of speaking like you know in your feel your pauses right you know, feel your pauses. and they'll say ah, uh, uh, you know feel your pauses or don't say anything at all right uh you know how to calm down spot something over there a light a clock something to relax you so and i got intrigued about communications you know and so that's what led me into the area of of communication so now you you get into social work did you know because i took a social work class i took sociology right it it wasn't the most interesting thing for me right but i know there are different levels of it did you know that uh what you were getting into when when you made the decision to go into so social work because it's vast um Lowe's, honestly uh my undergraduate degree in police science right i interviewed with uh border patrol fbi and and all dea and i realized and i was devastated i said i spent four years on this degree and i realized those weren't the things i wanted to do and the truth about social work, I, I was invited to an open house uh, at Adelphi. And like I said, my role wasn't easy. I took a class at Adelphi. Social work did not grab me. I was like, what are you saying? I was going like, wait a second. This is kind of boring. I'm, I'm not sure. And I didn't do well. Adelphi didn't ask me to come back. But I went to Fordham to an open house. And, you know, if you talk about spiritual exchange, there was a woman there because I called there right after Adelphi told me we don't think you're social work material. And uh, I called there and I guess I had fear in my voice. So when I went to the open house, this woman looked at me, and said, you know what? The look on your face, you sound like this guy who called here last week who was <laughs> afraid. And she said to me, is your name Dennis Andrews? And I was blown away. I said, yes. This lady actually grabbed me by my wrist, walked me over to the registrar's table and said, there is no such thing as failure 
with education. It's learned experience. Mm -hmm. And just from there, that just kind of uh, turned my whole perspective. And uh, once I got into Fordham, I looked at it differently. I, I started to be more, more receptive to hearing things. Uh, I think what really drove me coming from Mount Vernon and seeing how amazing Mount Vernon was for me and then to see the significant turnaround where there was a disconnect and we had the disproportionate amount of youth and the violence. One of my uh, utopic goals was, why can't we turn Mount Vernon back to where it was? So a lot of the people can mm -hmm. see how uh, synergistic Mount Vernon was and how we looked out for each other. And that was one of the things that drove me uh, to social work. And then once, once I started to connect, it found me. So before when I was bored, it just started to open up. There were challenges, but uh, I just fell in love with it. And then just meeting amazing people, people from Mount Vernon who were social workers, people who encouraged me. It just opened up my eyes and then the doors just start opening up and it, it just became my pathway. Right. So, you know, and, just and happy. Yeah, were, were there any, what was the specialty of the part of social work that you started out with? Um, the specialty was family, clinical and family, helping families and doing clinical. Um, I was working in substance abuse, but I wasn't really sure if that was the calling for me because I didn't have a history. But mm -hmm. um, once I started doing family work and uh, learning more things in, uh, in the field, uh, I started to look at my assets as being sober all my life. I'm teaching people how to be sober, not to share war stories. So I learned to take some of the things that I did my whole life and make it a tool to help people free themselves from the, the demons of addiction. Hmm. And it just, it, I think it fell in place. This, this is, it found me, I didn't find it. And then the blessing and things and discovery, if you truly want to invest, you allow those doors to keep opening up. Uh, for, I still have the same drive at 38 years in the field than I, I, as I had when I was maybe two or three years in the field, because there's so much you're learning, so much discovery. Just like when, when you tell me all these things you're doing, the discovery with the, this podcast. I, I think all these things are amazing. It keeps us relevant. Hmm. Yeah, it does. And 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 so, I mean, being in being in the field of social work and particularly dealing with families. So that I just remember, um, I was sitting. <laughs> I, I'm not a social worker, but my wife is, and I'm, I'm all around. I was all around social workers. So my you know, I, I felt like I was being analyzed every day, you know, so my mother, my mother in law was a social worker. <laughs> my wife was a social worker. My sister in law is a social worker. I'm like, uh, <laughs> you know, I got to watch what I say, what I do, you know, all kind of things like that. But um, I happen. I, mean, I don't know. I don't know why they invited me. I think one of the reasons I think maybe one of the reasons they invited me uh, to it. I was the executive director of the Boys and Girls Club. So they have invited about maybe 10, 12 people. And it was a family, a family of, uh, I think, uh, three. It was a mother and a, little, a boy and a girl. And I was sitting at the table with them, and it was social workers, you know, uh, family therapists. It was a bunch of stuff. And they were, they were dealing with a family, and this, this family. And they were talking about how, how erratic the kids are, you know. And I, I listened to everything they were saying. I didn't say much people were talking about it because they was they were skilled in it they were professionals they were credentialed in it i mean i don't i'm i don't know about what i'm i'm the guy at the boys and girls club right but one of the things i recognized was when you look at a, the, the mother's history she was working doing well had a place to live and the kids were doing well right and then now she she's she had no job right so she's struggling to pay her bills so now you lose your you know you you lose your plate your home and then your kids are erratic right so i'm just sitting there and they're saying all kind of things and i said well you know what i mean i'm just looking at her history like why can't we help her get a job i mean she's credentialed uh you know she needs a job look at her before before and after the job right and 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 I, I felt like if, if the if the mother got the job, right, then the kids will change. I mean, because she would go back to a place to live. Kids are doing well. 
you know, um, before it got worse. But they had the whole family court. Everybody was in there, you know. But um, and so when you when you when you think about being in that in that in this career early, particularly earlier, and you talked about families. I mean, talk a little bit about what you've seen over the years and even currently about where fa- where people are in regards to family. Um, well, I, I can tell you, Lowe's, um, addiction impacts everybody's family directly or indirectly. Uh, mm-hmm. I have, you know, it's so crazy. I, I have a sister-in-law who played college basketball. She was All-American, struggled with alcohol. I, I ended up uh, raising her son uh, because it became a CPS case and we had to go get him from Georgia. And um, the top part about the dynamics of addiction, this was a 11 year old uh, young boy who was having anxiety attacks, trying to take care of his mother. And one of the things I had to do seeing it in the family, I had to teach him how to be a kid and to relax and not have anxiety attacks and set his, set his eye on the prize and, this is a young man who talked about uncle. I always want to run track and he's doing well. He's a freshman on a full scholarship at Oklahoma university, the Sooners for track. So when it's in your family, you know, you can't run from it. You want to do the best because this is a devastating illness. The impact it has can be multi-generational and you've seen it. You, you saw at the boys club, you guys did so much. You had people coming in, kids struggling with parents using, uh, when you see poverty and we have significant poverty in Mount Vernon, you're going to see the devastation of addiction, alcoholism, drug use. And it's hard to deal with the reality of it, especially you see the impact on children because they don't know what to do with those emotions. They don't know how to run. They can't pack their bags up and go, listen, mom and dad are unstable. Let me go move next door. They would love to fantasize like that, but they have to endure lots of times uh, lie and take care of their younger siblings. And so that that they're forced to be into an adult role when they're children. And so my biggest fear now, because coming out of the pandemic, we have a lot of empty chairs in households where loved ones have died from, from COVID. Uh, we, have, we have a new array of alcoholics because um, we had the, many of the liquor stores still open during pandemic. So a lot of people were drinking. We're seeing the emergence now with people now coming out and starting to socialize. We're seeing the alcohol problem and the fentanyl, the impact substance abuse and overdoses having on families is overwhelming. You got empty chair syndromes from COVID. We have a lot of overdose. We have families and disarray. So, you know, especially in social work, you want to try to do the best uh, for families, especially children. But sometimes there's so much dysfunction. It's a closed system. You try to do the best before they get uh, wrapped up in the system, but it's overwhelming. And that's what my biggest fear is now. As we go further into moving away from COVID, how much will be revealed in terms of <clears throat> dysfunction in, with families, spilling over into the school systems, family court, we're seeing it. You, you got you to be seeing it at the boys club kids mm-hmm. coming in with, with a lot of needs. It's it's frightening. We're seeing in at NCADD, we're getting calls, families needing help. And it, it doesn't discriminate. It doesn't discriminate whether you uh, have economic uh, disabilities or you're affluent. It crosses the spectrum. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, we were having uh, troubles before the pandemic. Yeah. You're having uh, troubles after the pandemic um talk talk a little bit about um how you got involved um with ncadd um and and also talk about let's let's start a kind of peeling the onion here uh in regards to the things that nca nca ncadd does okay um I was invited to a board member by Joan. Joan, okay. said, Joan said something pretty interesting to me. She said, uh, <laughs> I think you have potential. I think you could be on our board. This is like 20 years ago. Okay. So I went to one of her luncheons with my boss. 
and I was invited to a board member, a meeting. And I remember going and I was intimidated because there were judges, there were a lot, there were doctors, there were a lot of people there. And I was like, wow, I don't know if I fit in here. And I remember a woman saying to me, sit down, sweetie, you can sit right here. She was real nice, come to find out she was one of the judges in White Plains. So I said, okay, uh, I think I'll get involved. And one of the driving forces that uh, really pushed me to join the council, Joan was a doer, she got things done. And I was running a program in Mount Vernon and one of my goals was, could I take things from the council and bring it to the city of New Rochelle and get things done? Because I watched how she was able to orchestrate and get judges and get people involved and get resources. And I felt that that was one of the things that we had gaps in in, in Mount Vernon. Uh, getting resources, uh, helping families that were in, in despair. I was trying to learn from them. So uh, that's how I first got involved. And then I think the next piece was Joan, all of a sudden, after maybe knowing her for uh, six months, she said, let's revitalize the KSAC school. And I was telling her that we don't have enough time. And she was going, that's not acceptable. So we started putting the school together foundationally in April, and she had that school open in September. And I was just blown away how she was able to uh, facilitate it and then get it going. So those are the things that drove me into the council. What could I bring back to uh, communities like Mount Vernon to make a difference with, uh, especially the kids? And it was, it's been a 20-year learning process. Uh, the council has been amazing in terms of what we offer now we just recently were approved from New York State for opioid prevention. We do opioid prevention education and provide Narcan kits. We have uh, the schools. We have three layers of the school, the KSAC school accelerated program, 14 weeks during the day. We have the Saturday program that's Saturday, every Saturday for 12 months. We have the evening program, which is Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. That's about 10 months, six to nine. And we have the recovery coach slash SERPA program where we're getting people to become recovery coaches and peer advocates. We're also looking to add or expand our children's programs and some more sites in Westchester. Going back to the boys club and then trying to get into the youth bureau up in White Plains. So we're, we're really looking to expand uh, our resources and, and connect more especially with the Hispanic community, it's a growing population uh, in uh, Westchester to provide uh, life skills for many of the Spanish speaking families. Uh, so she's really uh, branched out. And I believe for 2023, we're looking to do some more outreach work with veterans, some of the displaced veterans who have drug problems, some mental health issues, more prevention education and uh, uh, referrals. But uh, pretty much that's a, a lot of the things we, we do there. Uh, go, we've been going into the, the Catholic schools, speaking to uh, a lot of the young ladies. And this was pretty interesting, going into the Catholic high schools that are gender specific with uh, teenage girls, the burden that many young ladies are carrying, uh, covering up a lot of things for their boyfriends and for their friends who are using. So we started to provide some uh, leadership for many of the young ladies who are caretakers, not so much using, but caretakers for many of their friends that are using and their boyfriends. And Joan has been doing that for a while. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, as I, as my wife was saying that uh, we were, uh, Arms Acres was blessed to have a KSAC school on the site before the pandemic. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, people understand what that is. I mean, when you say, okay, well, we offer these school things, you know, what what does that mean? What does that take uh, in terms of, you know, the education or the training part of it? What What is that? What is a KSAC? KSAC for New York State is a certified uh, addiction specialist. Um, minimum requirements are 350 uh, clock hours with a GED high school diploma associate's degree or better and so there are now there are different levels there are ksac ksac 2 advanced ksac master ksac we offer the 350 education hours 
that allows you to prepare to become a certified trainee, which makes you employable, and then take the New York State uh, exam. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to acquire 6,000 hours of field work, and that's where relationships like Arms Acres, um, Arms Acres has been great to a lot of our students. They get uh, internships there, they get hired there. It's a great start. All the hours they do there because it's an oasis licensed facility, uh, uh, students are getting uh, field hours and good employment and learning experiences. So the foundation of the school is we provide four modules specific to what the state requires for students to learn. Uh, pharmacology, ethics, case management, group individual theory process, and all of this is designed to prepare them for the state exam and give them the foundation to work in the field. The advantage of the CASAC once you have completed the hours and you submit your paperwork to the state, you will then become a KSAC trainee, which is good for five years. You can work in the field under supervision. So that allows a student who needs to earn an income, they can work. They have to work under uh, supervision. But the advantage of working under supervision, you're going to work under a, a qualified health professional, which would be a KSAC social worker or somebody licensed or certified that they get good learning experience. So fundamentally they're sound and uh, they can contribute uh, to their career. We get, we offer through a collaboration through Mercy College, uh, students can get upwards of 16 credits towards a bachelor's degree. If they wanna continue their education at Mercy. Uh, Empire State College gives 12 um, credits if a student wants to continue their education. So it gives a lot of pathways if somebody really wants to come in the field and go in different directions. It just doesn't have to be KSAC. It can open up other avenues if somebody wants to go into mental health or go into social work. So it's a good, it's a good start. Um, we're hands-on. Uh, even though the pandemic, we're Zoom, but we are hybrid. We're live on Zoom, and we have students in the classroom at the same time. Oh, nice. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's good. And then some of the other, uh, uh, programs, you know, cause break, can you break down the, when, when a, a program is started, like in a school for youth, can you, can you break down? I think it's the different, uh, yeah, we, um, we use a evidence-based model. It's a life skills model where we're working with elementary and high school kids. The design is to give young people an opportunity to develop a voice so they can express how they're feeling. They can conceptualize some of the things that they're, that they're experiencing at home and that it gives them a form that they can reach out, talk to people, um, understand that a lot of things that they're going through, it doesn't make them uh, different that a lot of families experience this. I think the most important part about the program that makes it successful, that the children are talking. They, they might, uh, they will talk more to their parents. And I think that's so important that kids are talking to their parents and say, mom and dad, I love you. You, I want you to get help. I have this uh, instructor, this teacher at the boys club who gives me a lot of information about substance abuse. That voice from that child maybe can be something that will lure that parent into reaching out for help. So the life skills program is good because if anything, we can start detecting some of the concerns, some of the signs of trauma early and do preventive measures to help this child not to develop a curiosity to use drugs or to escape to drugs. Yeah, and, and one, one of our former uh, alumnus of, of, of the Boys and Girls Club, uh, he us he's usually on the uh, blueprint every Sunday. I used to see him up there, Kevin, uh, Kevin Bunch. Um, and he's uh, the president of the board for for white cop i mean in mount vernon uh and you know this may be something to look at that's an organization to look at in mount vernon but uh we've been talking a lot about mount vernon but uh i have to say uh as well that ncabd does not just deal with mount vernon right but they're all over it's ncadd of westchester so uh even though we're talking about mount vernon the things that are happening in Mount Vernon could be happening anywhere in Westchester. Uh, so I wanted to get that out there. And I've been uh, 
able to attend uh, over the years, a number of the conferences that uh, NCABB had before the pandemic, a lot of amazing uh, workshops, a lot of amazing speakers on, 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 on this issue. This is a very, very serious issue. Um, th these are very serious things that, and, and here's a question I have for you, Dennis. Um, because at, at one time, um, I, I remember, I think it was either a rabbi. I mean, she was on the, um, she was a, a, a board member. I can't remember uh -huh. her name. And um, I remember we, we were talking about uh, addiction in the church, right? And, and, uh, and I guess you guys were expressing you know, the need not only to just to be in schools and different organizations, but you were talking about churches, right? And and because uh, many pastors don't, well, I'm, I'm not going to say they don't, but um, it seems like many pastors don't think that they need, uh, you know, organizations like NCADD and dealing with alcohol and drug dependency. And, and I remember the rabbi saying that she allowed one of you, one of you guys, to come, uh, to come speak at uh, at the synagogue, and 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 uh, the person was sharing their story about their addiction, right? And then they they were they were offering services, and how many people came up in the in the uh, in the synagogue came up asking for information right and and sometimes uh you know what what do you think because there's and this is just my, i tried to put together something for for westchester in regards to uh awareness prevention and training and help inside the church what's, what's your thoughts on the partnership between uh ncadd or any organization in regards to uh the areas i spoke about that could be used or needed inside of a church no it, it's vital one, one of the goals of the council is to make the information client or, or community and person friendly because addiction doesn't discriminate it's doctors i've treated doctors lawyers uh priests so and one of the concerns especially when you look at uh religious sectors uh and and not to cause problems you can hide you can hide your addiction uh lots of times in churches you don't talk about mental health you don't talk about substance abuse but it's prevalent it exists uh and lots of times it's not talked about and people get overwhelmed um and it's dismissed but it needs to be talked about one of the goals of the council is to make this a dialogue that is friendly to people so we can be more proactive than reactive. One of the problems with addiction is if we're reactive, people are coming to us when the problems are severe. Reach out to us before they become problematic. And I think that's one of the things that the council tries to do with some of the preventive measures. How can we have this conversation to make people uh, be more aware and not look at the shame and guilt or blame themselves? It's like this got a little froze there. Um, yeah, um, I mean, this. I hope we can get. Uh, we're having a little technical difficulties here. And hopefully, we get uh, Dennis back in a, in a moment. Um, but yeah, it was just something I was con. Uh, I was personally concerned about as being a member of the uh, NCADD. One of one of my things was to. Um, not only broaden the spectrum in, in regards to early childhood trauma, and because I know that personally, as a, as a young kid, I was dealing with some 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 different things that were happening in my life, um, and and so I was looking back at some of the things I had experienced and some of the things I wrote in my book um, about family and family addiction and trauma, uh, and 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 uh, you know. And in writing my book, I didn't know I was still in having some 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 
personal issues around trauma uh, when I was writing the book, how some things that had happened when I was young met, still manifest today. And I, I was thinking like being an elder in the church, being a minister in the church, being a member of the church, uh, being in an executive director that goes to church or just a church member, um, everybody comes into comes into churches, right? Um, I think we all come in, uh, you know, because we all want to grow spiritually, right? Uh, the same way as as we go to school, right? We we go to school so that we can grow educationally. Uh, we go to the gym and work out, and 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 we work out because we want to grow and we want to get stronger physically, right? Uh, so. Uh, you know, the thing is, we go to church so that we can grow spiritually, so it impact us mentally, so it impact us physically as well, and vice versa. And and so I was just thinking when I was doing NCADD that uh, how it could impact my Boys and Girls Club and the young people who come to the Boys and Girls Club every single day. I seen the impact that it had on uh, elementary schools. I seen the the impact that it was having. Um, in, in middle school, and I've seen the impact it was having in, in high school, uh, being able to communicate with kids and get them to express how they were feeling. Uh, and then I started thinking about, like, as a minister into the church, sometimes we do preaching, like we're preaching, um, but some people that we are preaching to, they may have uh, a problem with addiction. They come to the church and, and they hear the word they hear the word of God and they may be a member of the church. Um, but that, that sometimes that doesn't necessarily solve their problem. So they come there and, you know, it's like, we get this fixed. We feel good for a moment, but yet we leave out the door and we're still having these behavior problems. We are still having these addictive behavior problems. And so it'd be nice if there was, an, you know, I, I believe that, that right inside of our churches, honestly, right inside of our churches, there are social workers, they are people who are dealing with this every single day, right? That And it should be a part of your ministry, uh, dealing with addiction, dealing with alcoholism, dealing with drug abuse uh, should be a part of ministry, right? And and and, and what and we should be able to provide because we've got individuals in our churches, we should be able to buy, provide help uh, for for individuals in our churches, right? And, 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 and the preaching is good and sometimes we get miracles. You know, uh, sometimes we get miracles. Some people come into church, they hear a word from the Lord, they hear the they hear the word of God, and all of a sudden, man, they get a miracle, and they no longer, you know, have this feeling towards a substance, uh, you know, and or an addiction, and 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 and. But it doesn't happen for everybody, so we have to go beyond just. J we have to get down to the get down to some real serious things about how to get people help you know, and, and how to get people in, in, in programs and services that can, that's a part of their spiritual growth. The church still provides a part of the spiritual growth, but we have to deal with uh, how do we deal mentally with these addictions that we may be going through. And, and some people are licensed and qualified right in our churches. And it should be a part of our ministry, um, uh, a part of ministry. And so many people, social workers, and I, I don't want to beat this up, but they're, you know, just like we're having a we're having problems we're having problems in in in, in particularly in african american neighborhoods we're having problems academically problems with kids graduating from uh, schools and yet but yet in our churches in our ministries we have teachers there we have administrators there right the best place on earth that should be in terms of educating people should be in the church we should be providing those educational services inside the church and outside the church and 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 the social work issues we should be providing because we've got licensed people in our churches we should be providing those services inside our churches and and now we're already doing it outside because that's our jobs and and then this is back but i was just uh i was on my soapbox there man. <laughs> no no Lowe's, you're right though you're it, you know a lot of what we've done came through the church yeah. A lot. I remember growing up, everything was through the church. A lot yeah. of the, a lot of our foundation came through the church. Well, you know what? Many people don't know that uh, during the war, right? 
um, when the men went off the war historically, went went off the war, and and the women were left back home with with their children, and the boys became wayward. They became juvenile delinquents, right? And it was the women in the church, the first boys in the first boys club of America was started in a church, right? Where the women invited young boys in, delinquent boys in, provided them breakfast and provided them recreation and, and arts and crafts and, 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 and lunch right and gave them something to do started the first boys in, started the first boys club in massachusetts so i mean you you know uh and then it and then all of a sudden next thing you know boy boys clubs started pop, popping up everywhere because yeah. we needed a place for boys to go right and and it started in the church but you right. you want to hear something interesting about mount vernon and people don't talk about this. There was a resident of Mount Vernon named Dr. J. Adi Jiggets. And Dr. Jiggets did a lot of work through Macedonia Church. Mm -hmm. Macedonia Church and Dr. Jiggets started the first children's program uh, where children had parents of substance abusers at risk. Mm -hmm. She started that program, which was implemented out of Macedonia Church, and then that became a statewide program. That was started in Mount Vernon by a, a social worker who lived in Mount Vernon, out of the church. A lot of those programs came out of the church. Awesome, man. Yeah. And, and and another thing is, many people don't know that the Boys Club of Mount Vernon started was started by the first Presbyterian Church in Mount Vernon. Yeah. They, they were they were the biggest supporters of the Boys Club uh, back in the day. It started with the church. Right. And I think in this society, it needs to restart with the church. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, but I mean, you know, NCAD, NCADD and, and Dennis, um, you guys are doing an amazing job. You know, one of the things that when you're trying to help people who are really struggling, man, you can't always get the help necessary. So I want to say, I mean, is there, um, if somebody wanted to donate uh, to NCADD, if somebody wanted to get information about NCADD, what, what, where would they go? What would they do? Um, um, they actually could call. The, they can call the 914-949-8500 telephone number. We have the website. They can go on the website. But one of the reasons why I would encourage them to call, because we always have somebody in the office that would uh, – give them a lot of insight and what they can do because people call often to ask for help or to make a referral or to want to make a contribution. And we've set up some scholarships uh, recently for, we had a board member who overdosed from, from pain meds. So we set up a scholarship in Sydney White's name. And so, you know, uh, anybody who wants to get further information or just struggling, they're welcome to come by uh, two fifty on white plains. We have a young man who's uh, forty-five days sober. He just comes in, and we work it from there. You know, we're trying to get him into school. Uh, what's great about where the office is is not just the national council. We have uh, meetings. We have AA meetings uh, there all day. There's another segment of AA meetings. You have the loft, which does a lot of support work for LGBT gay uh, groups. So there's so much going on where we are. So it's almost like a shopping mall for help. Mm -hmm. And so I just tell people, if you're not sure, just call us. If we don't know, we'll, we'll refer. Um, in terms of detox, things like that. Uh, rehab, uh, your wife has been instrumental. She's helped us. We've got not only students to work there, but we've gotten people there for treatment. And so Arms Acres has been a hub uh, when I was in the field, we used uh, for years. So, you know, those are the blessings. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking like we're, we're coming up on, you know, one of, one of the, you know, one of the times that is, I'm excited about is this season. I've always been excited about this season, but um, because it's about giving, it's about 
Thanksgiving. I mean, you know, so it's about family, you know, but it is some sometimes in these seasons, they become very tragic in these seasons because, you know, people have lost loved ones. Um, people are going through loss. Uh, you're still managing the pandemic. There's so many crazy things going on right now. Um, and you have to be able to know if you're hurting that there are places you can get help. You know, um, and, and NCADD is one of those. Our churches is, you know, always our churches uh, are there. I mean, and and uh, yeah, this, this is just a, a crazy season. And so talk about uh, Dennis and what it looks like in the future uh for you and 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 ncadd man what or or what do you imagine man that uh you know what what's what's you know i, I said be a little creative and think about like think outside the box and think about how we can you know what you would like to see uh honest you know. the honest truth uh Lowe's, i've talked to you about this uh before um i haven't really made a lot of plans for the future because I believe my foundation is solid wherever I'm supposed to end up. It's part of God's plan and, and I'll end up there. But one of the things I had said to you before, because I'd like to grab on to you and pick your brain because you always give me good stuff. And um, I've always admired how you carry yourself and the things you've done. Um, I would love to start a movement just to get people to be okay with being human and being okay in their skin. Um, and I, I think it's so important. Uh, how do we help people just reconnect with being people, uh, smiling at people? I remember being in the store the other day playing, playing a lot. And there was a guy in there, man. He was in bad shape and he was asking for money. And I said, listen, man, I'll buy you an energy drink. I'm not going to buy you some beer. And I said, you need to get off the streets. It's cold out here. You don't have any shoes on. It's just some of the words we need to say to people, the, the human connection. I would love to see a movement where we have people mentoring and giving back to young people. Our young people are so lost because they don't have the connection I had with older people, had a lot of respect. You know, I laugh because I remember Denzel being in my sister's band, they weren't that good, but I had so much respect for them being older than me, you couldn't be disrespectful. So my it sister was said, a oh, sing, it was a singing group? Yeah, they were a singing group, man. They weren't yeah. that good. You they know, he, good. he actually told me, <laughs> He actually was talking to me about that. He said, man, I used to say, I was like, oh, come on, man. Yeah, he was, <laughs> listen, Mo, so the next time you talk to him, that was in the garage of my parents' house across <laughs> from Longfellow. Okay. And, uh, but what made it so powerful, we had a level of respect for the people older than us and they gave to us. We stopped passing knowledge to the young people. And if anything, what we need to be mindful of, the 21st century, brings on nuances that we're not even aware of technology. We've lost a lot of blue collar jobs because of technology. We have to prepare our children to be successful. You talked about generational wealth. We have to instill in them how to navigate what's coming in the future, being proactive. And just if, what I would love to see with the council, more collaborations with more communities all over, not just Westchester. Uh, working more with other uh, agencies. We have great relationships with Arms Acres. I would like to see more collaborations and synergy with, with other uh, health providers so we can provide more services. I think if anything, I would ask people, and I know this is tough, we can't always look for money. You gotta, you gotta give. You gotta be willing to volunteer time. People did that for me, which gave me a future. It can't always be about I gotta be paid for my services. The rewards of seeing somebody doing well is a lot better than that uh, 20 or $30 you're going to put in your pocket. Because people always come back and, and smile and remind you of that word, that kind word that maybe stopped them from saying, today's the last day of me living. That the smile or uh, low saying something to me made me reevaluate this whole concept of living. And we got to get back to that. And I would love to see in the future that we just start spending more time caring about people and not being so divisive. Yeah, I, I mean, I actually was, um, you know, somebody was asking me about uh, the difference in times of, you know, us growing up and and growing up today. You know, I, I can't really remember uh, in the boys club, 
uh, yeah, there were there were paid workers, probably part time workers, not many full time workers. But I can remember the men working there. They didn't work there. They volunteered there. You know, they came home after their job. Right. And they came to the boys club and, um, you know, and 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 uh, and we don't have enough. People are more concerned and and you should be without 100 percent. You should be. I was I was, too. When we have kids, we are young people today. We have kids. Right. And we have to not only be concerned about our kids, but they got we have kids out there that don't have anybody. That's what I love about the past because those men had kids, right? But they took the time to say something to me and to stop me and maybe mentor me, right? We don't have the privilege, and particularly as African Americans, we don't have the privilege to say, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna worry about my kids and I'm not gonna worry about nobody else's kids, you know. And, and I think that's what you're talking about today. And you know, I, I always had a problem in the in the boys and girls club but later later in my in my career was that you know everybody that were, i'll give you an example uh, my sister uh was a part of the dance organization and also the cheerleaders and then she started the cheerleading program she didn't get paid right marion archer who we, we who we honored um and you probably seen at our, our galas uh with the revelators she volunteered right uh tommy bennett who was a former member of the boys and girls club was a karate sensei he volunteered to do karate at the Boys and Girls Club. I mean, when you think about all our AAU programs, nobody got paid. All those guys felt like the Boys and Girls Club did this for them. They turned around and did the same thing. Yeah. Right. And so we don't know what volunteerism is anymore. Right. Uh, people don't know how to give back anymore. They just everybody said with a handout, you know, okay, hey, hey, you know, pay me, man, you know. And we're not asking much time, but we're saying like, look, hey, give us an hour. I think my wife had a question up there. Yeah, she had put uh, a question up in regards to KSAC and college credit, which is a good one. Um, the advantage of going to, first of all, the advantage of going to a KSAC school like the council, it's called the community base. So it's a little different from a Title IV school, which would be a college. So when you complete our program, the advantage of taking all our classes and presenting it to let's say mercy college you want to go to mercy and you want to uh get your bachelor's degree in human services well they will give you 16 to 18 credits towards your bachelor's degree when you look at that you have now been given credit for a whole semester so that makes a big difference you've now reduced the cost of school by 18 credits which is substantial and that puts you closer to um, getting your degree. The other advantage of the relationship we have with Mercy, uh, getting your uh, undergrad plus your KSAC, um, you, you will be a qualified health professional with the KSAC, or we even offer it at a graduate level. If you transition from a bachelor's in human service into a master's in mental health, you'll be licensed and you'll have your credential as a KSAC. Uh, BSW programs, if you go into a school for your bachelor's in social work with your KSAC and get advanced standing, you can do your master's in social work in about a year, which saves you a lot of money. There are advantages with the education. What I always tell students, talk to the provost, the registrar, and ask for life credits. If the school does not have an agreement with KSAC, you ask them for life credits where they will give you um, a waiver saying that the classes you've taken, which falls under behavioral health, should uh, give you some um, credit uh, towards your degree. And most of the schools are doing that now. So uh, we, we have a good relationship with Mercy and some of the other schools, and it's now becoming an advantage. Whereas uh, a lot of students going back to school and I always tell them this, if you are an older person who might not have done well in high school going into the ksac school and being older it's a different learning format we're more hands-on and a lot of things that you learn in the ksac school you'll see more descriptive in college so you won't be at a disadvantage you'll be an advantage 
because sociology, uh, a lot of the behavioral sciences, a lot of it is covered in the KSAC program, just not as in detail in an academic program. So actually students coming out of the KSAC program have an advantage coming out of KSAC and now transitioning into a uh, matriculating program in a college. So it's, it's, it's good. And a lot of our students have gone on. I'll give an example. We've had a, we actually had a student who was a roofer for 20 years in New York City, came to the KSAC school, loved it, went to Mercy undergrad and uh, finished an undergrad and uh, social work, then uh, went to uh, Fordham University and now was an MSW, got his license, and he got his license at age 65. Hmm. And he loves what he's doing. He loves what he's doing. Wow. So you're, you're never too old to, to learn. I have an intern who's 75 years old. And she worked throughout the pandemic and loves learning. Was a KSAC student at 70. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah KSAC yeah. student at 70. So, I mean, um, the school's enlightening. It really opens up your eyes to other aspects. Uh, people assume they, they know a lot about addiction. There are so many components to addiction that people are not aware of or have even the insight to what clinicians do. It, there is a lot of theory. It's not easy work. People think talk therapy is easy. There are strategies. It's a lot to get somebody to make a decision to give up drug taking behavior and to live sober. It's not easy. So they get this exposure. And uh, that's the one thing I love about the case at school, especially with Joan. Joan feels uh, you have to step up to the plate. If she feels you can't, she has no problem letting teachers go. She's, she's a stickler for that. Please be competent. That's her favorite word. You got to be competent or you can't teach for NCADD. Awesome, man. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Dennis, if you think back um, over your life, man, outside of a family member, I mean, who, who who's the person you think has had an impact in your life? Um, I would say my father. My um, my father was, actually my father uh, grew up, was born in the Rochelle. My father was the first African-American male to attend um, Cardinal Hayes High School. Okay. From, from Westchester. And he got his diploma in Japan. He got drafted. He couldn't even walk across the stage. He was in Japan. And uh, my father always put emphasis on education and what it can do for you. He was also a member. You mentioned some names, Archer. A lot of these people are historic in, in Westchester. Their relationship with the T Tuskegee Airmen, Charles W. Dickinson, which is an all-black drum corps. My father wrote a lot of the music for them. Um, their foundation, um, crossing color barriers when there was so much segregation, the music uh how people transcend to them so my father had the biggest influence on me my father said to me one day he said never do drugs it'll weaken your spirit it'll make you a monster and i think he told me that at 10 and that's something i always held on to even as an adult now he said never do it find something else to do that will enlighten you and that's just been some mantra that i've carried with, with me all my life Okay, so you gave me a family member. What about somebody outside the family? Just a, uh, a name of her. I would tell you the person that had a major influence on my future was Dr. J. Ida Jiggets. Mm. I used to work for I did a lot of volunteer work, and I used to bump heads with her because she was outspoken. See, I can tell you, she said to me uh, when I was young, she said, you're, you're too arrogant. And you got to get some mileage. You don't have the right to be arrogant. You don't have enough mileage. And I'm going to help you get mileage. And uh, she put me to work. Uh, I learned a lot from her. Uh, I'll share this story and God rest her soul. Uh, I, I cleaned up her basement one time in her house. It was an amazing place, the, the books. She was an African-American woman who was a social worker who did her Ph.D., her her studies in Israel in the mm. 50s. She wrote a book. It's called Black Black Social Work in Israel. So I go in the basement, I'm cleaning stuff up, and I see a stack of her books. 
I take one of the books, I stick it in my waist, I come back upstairs, and she's smiling and she's going to me. Did you find anything interesting that you would like? And I go, no, but she must have saw the bulge. I took one <laughs> of her books. And uh, that book, that book enlightened me. Um, I still wasn't sure that's what I wanted to do, but just what she had to do as a woman of color back in her days. She was a woman who was going to Penn, Penn State, Columbia University at the same time because they didn't have computers to track her scholarships. She did this. She was a nurse. She's done so many amazing things. She had to prepare six months worth of food and freeze it for her husband in order to go to Israel to finish her PhD. That drive to me is amazing, especially with the obstacles she had to endure during mm. a period of time that she, she was growing up. So I think uh, Dr. Jiggets, if anybody, she had told me a long time ago, there's two things you're going to do, Dennis. You're either going to be a lawyer or you're going to be a social worker. And I was laughing. And I said, neither. <laughs> that is not what I was going to do. <laughs> Actually, what I wanted to do, and people laugh at this, I grew up with Ricky Gidron, who was a friend of mine, Dick Gidron, the black Cadillac dealer, mm -hmm. uh, dealership in Fordham Road. My whole goal, believe it or not, in undergrad at Marist was to get my degree, go to Mr. Gidron and say, Mr. Gidron, I have education. Can you hire me to sell cars? And it never happened. I never had the courage to call them and reach <laughs> out. Uh, instead, I got in the field and this field found me and I didn't find it. And uh, I've been blessed ever since. I've, I've had great role models. There, there's been amazing people uh, in Westchester that we don't give enough credit to that's made a difference in my life. Dr. Yeah. Jiggis is one of them. The black mayor, the first black mayor of Mount Vernon lived on my block, Mayor Blackwood. Mm. And uh, he kept it real. He was tough. And yeah. so I, I, I'm, I'm blessed to be influenced by some of these people. So real quick, uh, cause we, 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 we're ending here and uh, I got, but I gotta, I gotta get you to tell me uh, something Tell us something quick about the uh, because what is a recovery coach? A quick. recovery coach is is a person who's experienced uh, substance abuse or alcoholism, and um, now becomes a mentor to people who are struggling with addiction. Uh, they go through the training is about um, eight weeks. They become certified. The next piece is seventeen hours of ethics, which makes them a uh, uh, certified parent advocate. The advantage of uh, a SERP and a recovery coach, they're mentors. They're working with people who are struggling with addiction. They are an asset to clinical staff because they can accompany people to meetings. They can talk to them. They self-disclose. They're, the, they're in the emergency rooms of the hospital, for people coming in with overdoses and concerns. They are a fellowship and a friendship to people with addiction okay and then finally um the final final question is first of all i want to say thank you for coming on man taking time out your busy schedule thank you um and what would you say to uh, a young person to encourage them to stay away from uh you know the evils of this uh, between drugs and alcohol what would you have what would you say to them the amazing thing about being young is there's discovery, there's, there's youth, there's energy. The dangerous things about drugs, and let's put it on drugs. Drugs are something that it can mess with the most important organ in your body, which is your brain. If you do damage to your brain, you are messing with, with sensory perception that gives you insight to what life is. And the dangers about addiction is it could be one time or a thousand times. You don't know what kind of impact it's going to have on you. We call addiction the disease, the chronic brain disease that impacts people's ability to process pleasure. Imagine having an illness where you can't process pleasure effectively. That pleasure could kill you. So I tell young people, you are blessed with being in the 21st century. Take advantage of the opportunities to be the best future self. Your best future self is anything you want to be. Don't do anything that can move you away from taking away choices. Education gives you choices. Great friendships, mentors give you choices. 
keep choices in your life as a young person. There is nothing you're going to do that hasn't been done already, theoretically, by people. So don't think you have all these answers that your experiences on this journey is going to be that significant, different than anybody else's. This is dangerous, though. This is a drug. These drugs today, they're supersized. They're not like the drugs of 30 years ago. The THC levels, they are designed to do significant permanent damage, if not take your life. I thought I was finished, but I got to ask this question, man. Positive or negative, um, you legalize marijuana. My, me, negative. It's a bad thing because we do know there is detriment for marijuana. They're not talking about this. There is a relationship with schizophrenia and other mental illnesses with dopamine receptor sites. It does uh, do damage to short-term memory. It impacts uh, men in terms of lowering testosterone. Uh, the other thing that where they've uh, got people completely fooled People are dying from marijuana. We don't have enough studies yet to show the direct correlation. And simply put, once you light marijuana up, everybody says it's so much safer than cigarettes. That's not true. Cigarettes, once lit, immenses about 5,000 chemicals in the atmosphere which you ingest. When you light up marijuana, you're lighting, lighting up about 4,500 different chemicals that are going in your body. Those are toxins. Simply toxins are poisons. Any poisons you put in your body, the body must work hard on getting rid of them. Just in the process of aging, the body won't be able to do that effectively. We do catastrophic, catastrophic damage to our body. There is no safe drug. It's a toxin. It doesn't exist. Never will. Hmm. Uh, Dennis, thanks a lot, man. Appreciate you for taking the time, man. I enjoyed it. Um, and and uh yeah it's awesome great information man um, i'm hope you guys are listening out there um you know again this is on you know once once we get off uh facebook or youtube it stays on so you get an opportunity if you didn't hear it before if you didn't hear it tonight you can hear it later if there's something you miss you can go back to it right and you can listen to it again um, and, and so I want to say again, thank you for your support of, of Lowe's More the Blueprint each and every week. And um, again, I want to say happy. Oh, there's Joan and uh, had Dow Strawberry was a, a guest speaker. Yeah. Yeah. At, at, at one of the galas at Dow, the great Dow Strawberry Mets, Yankees. Um, and again, thank you guys for your support. I want to say a, a pre happy Thanksgiving to each and every one of you guys. Enjoy your family. Uh, enjoy this week. And it, as I say each and every week, if you wake up tomorrow, make tomorrow your masterpiece. God bless you. And I love you and look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, Lowe's. You're welcome, Dennis. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Lowe's More, the Blueprint Podcast. Stay connected and follow us at our website, www.lowesmore.com. That's L-O-W-E-S-M-O-O-R-E.com. You can also join the discussion on Twitter at Lowe's More and on Facebook at Lowe's More Jr. As always, thank you for pushing your mindset towards a better reality. This concludes the most thought-provoking portion of your day. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this podcast to stay fully up to date with everything we're up to. Until next time, be kind to yourself and each other. With the kitchen, it's a joke. I ain't buying it like I'm broke. Insufficient funds for insignificant.